Um, thanks very much for coming along this evening. Um, an inaugural lecture. Num a number of people have asked me, what's it all about? And uh, I've been looking around a bit and as, as to why people might do an inaugural lecture. And I suppose the historic reason is to allow newly appointed professors, either because they've been promoted or have new joined a new university, to present themselves. So this is my presentation to you all. Here I am. Um, but also, it's um, a good opportunity to set out a research agenda, which is very much what I intend to do in my talk this evening, which will not go on until 8 o'clock, I hasten to add. Um, it's also an interesting opportunity for those of you who are not regularly involved in the law school, I see a few faces uh, who are not normally part of the law school, um, to find out what we do in, in the law school at Warwick and some of the uh, well, fairly novel things that we tend to, to do at Warwick, which um, I'm hoping to contribute to with my research. But most importantly, apparently, an inaugural lecture is a celebration, or as Roger kindly put it, a party. Um, and I'm sure there will be a party a bit later on. But before then, I'm afraid you will have to indulge me a little bit whilst I muse about the future of international commercial law in the digital world. And I'll try and do that in basically four broad steps. Um, I'll start off by looking at what I mean by international commercial law. It's one of those phrases where there's a lot of disagreement as to what exactly it covers. And continental <coughs> colleagues will often take quite a different view from common law colleagues. Um, so I will try and explain what I mean by international commercial law and give a little bit of background to that. As is so common with the digital world, because what I will then move on to is to say a few words about the digital world and some of the new business models which have sprung up in the digital world. Then think generally about what developments such as the digital world might mean for uh, law and the need of law to respond to such developments. And finally come full circle by drawing the link between international commercial law and the digital world, trying to survey the current state of affairs and also to identify where there is a need for immediate future action and perhaps also some degree of long-term perspective. So that's basically what I will try and do in about 45 minutes or so this evening. Let's start with the basics. Commercial law. What is commercial law and therefore what is international commercial law? When I talk about commercial law, when English scholars generally talk about commercial law, they tend to focus on transactions, essentially types of contract entered into between commercial parties. And commercial law is primarily concerned with all these legal principles and rules which relate to the private rights of the parties to a transaction. So it's not concerned, for example, with trade law and the regulation of trade, which is more a matter for international economic law, economic law generally. It's not concerned with corporate law and the regulation of business structures. It is not concerned with financial regulation and the way the conduct of banks, for example, is monitored by regulators. It's very much concerned with contracts. And of course, at the heart of every commercial transaction tends to be a very basic type of contract, neatly illustrated by the uh, one on the slide here, between a seller or a supplier of goods, services, or digital content, or a combination of those, and somebody who wants to buy or acquire these goods, services, or digital content. Straightforward contract, every first year contract law student will be bored to death with these types of contracts. But that's where it starts. Then it carries on. So from this basic type of transaction, we move to um, perhaps a situation whereby the contract is negotiated by involving a third party. So you have somebody called an agent getting involved, representing the seller or supplier perhaps, negotiating a contract with the buyer, and bringing about this contract that we then have between seller and buyer. So that's another type of commercial transaction, the relationship uh, involving an agent here. Sometimes, especially in international contracts, once, the good, once there's a contract in place for the sale of goods, um, you have to obviously ensure the goods are moved from the seller to the buyer. And this involves transport quite often. It may involve international carriage. So there will be a separate contract of carriage with a third-party carrier. So another type of contract. We might have a special arrangement whereby payment by the buyer is arranged through a system called the Documentary Credit System. This is a system which involves banks as trusted third parties, don't laugh, um, trusted third parties to uh, provide both seller and buyer with some reassurance that um, money won't be put beyond the buyer's reach until the seller has done his part of the bargain, but also 
to give a guarantee to the seller that once he has, for example, dispatched the goods, he will get paid for what he has done. Yeah? And banks are stepping in as intermediaries. Another type of commercial transaction. Then we might have um, slightly different types of arrangements. For example, the seller or indeed a bank may supply goods or might take some kind of security interest over goods to ensure that if the buyer hasn't yet paid, that he will pay eventually. So there might be, for example, um, a reservation of ownership clause in the contract between seller and buyer. Um, the seller may supply the goods only on lease, so the goods are only supplied for a temporary period. Similarly, a bank may, for example, advance some money to the buyer and take a security interest over goods or indeed physical assets belonging to the buyer. It's another type of transaction. And finally, perhaps, the seller may try and ensure he gets paid for um, money which is due under contract to the buyer by selling his right to receive payment to a bank or to a, a type of business called a factor. And that way, the buyer um, will then have to pay the bank or the factor, whereas the seller will receive money early on. So you can see there's a whole range of different transactions which are found in the commercial law field. Um, the interesting bit is when you have a seller and a supplier and a buyer from one country and from another country. And indeed, once you have, for example, a bank in a third country, a carrier in a fourth country, and so on, that's when we get into the realm of international commercial law. And those are the kinds of rules which are concerned specifically with those cross-border transactions, those transactions which affect multiple jurisdictions. And when we talk about international commercial law, we are particularly focusing on commercial law, which has its origin in not just in domestic laws, but primarily in international agreements, international texts, um, uh, which are intended to provide a degree of commonality for the number of countries which might subscribe to these rules. Why do we need it? We need it because of the multi-jurisdictional nature of international commercial contracts. Um, <clears throat> because otherwise we would have to spend a lot of time working out what the applicable law is. That's Bill's job primarily to teach students that. Very complicated, um, but fascinating. Um, so what international commercial law is trying to do is it's trying to kind of remove the, the impact of having significant differences between different jurisdictions to try and remove some of the severity of, of perhaps choosing the wrong law or being stuck with a law that wasn't expected by ensuring that for international commercial transactions we have common international rules in place. Well, it sounds very nice, doesn't it? But when we look at international commercial law, we can see that this is primarily driven by a number of, or a small number of, international organisations. Um, one is ANSI-TRAL, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, which has been responsible for quite a few of the key texts in commercial law on many of the topics I, uh, I mentioned a few moments ago. A second big player is UNIDRA, the Institute for the Unification of Private Law, um, which again has introduced a number of important measures in the field of international commercial law. The third one is the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, which has primarily focused on introducing um, default standard contract terms, such as the INCO terms, but also the documentary credit rules, which are governing these transactions involving banks in arranging payment and so on. The interesting feature of international commercial, which is why it fascinates me uh, quite significantly, is this focus on, on harmonization or unification, of trying to find common standards which could be attractive to a large number of jurisdictions. Because despite the um, similarities we might see in many commercial laws, if you compare different jurisdictions, there are still quite significant differences when can, which can catch people out. And it's always fascinating to see how we might try and overcome some of these differences to try and come up with rules which might be common to a number of different legal families and different legal systems. The way we try and get there is by a number of different measures. The two most significant ones are conventions, which are effectively binding treaties, negotiated at quite a high level, and eventually ratified, entered into by individual uh, nation states. These are binding treaties which are ap applicable as between those countries which sign up to those without any further need for amending domestic laws, necessarily. They might require some changes, but for the sake of argument, this is how it works. Model laws are quite different in the sense that they merely offer a template for national governments, 
to develop their own domestic laws based on a model law. Yeah. There's obviously an encouragement to try and copy out the model law as closely as possible, but that won't always be possible. But it at least offers a template. And again, the objective is to ensure a significant degree of commonality between different uh, jurisdictions. We can have lower level actions such as guides, which simply offer uh, an indication of the main issues that might need to be considered. And of course, finally, we have the UNIDRA principles on international commercial contracts as a kind of standalone document to govern commercial contracts, particularly um, in the context of arbitration, for example. Um, all these initiatives, with three big bodies involved in this, have of course led to a significant number of adopted texts. But when we look at the, the degree to which individual governments have supported these, the picture becomes a lot more patchy. And in fact, a lot of time and effort has gone into ratifying, sorry, into drafting a lot of conventions and model laws. But their subsequent utilization is, is rather mixed. Some have got quite a bit of support, some have got limited support, and some have never gained any kind of formal endorsement by anybody. Um, so what we don't have, although some people would very much like it, is a global commercial code, a single global commercial code applicable to all commercial transactions. That's something that just hasn't really made it into, into existence. I'm not going to talk about all of these. This is just to flag up the different areas where we have conventions and indeed model laws, um, ranging from popular ones such as the arbitration one and the UN Convention on the International Sale of Goods with quite a large number of state ratifications, um, to less successful ones, for example, um, the Convention Agency has only secured five ratifications. Um, other one, others have also secured rather low numbers of ratifications. Um, model laws in the same way. Some have been extremely successful. Some are so new that we don't yet know how successful they're going to be. Although Juliana will, ensure, will assure us that the model law on secured transactions will be extremely successful. So fingers crossed you might be right there, Juliana. <coughs> A few general problems that I see here before I get on to the uh, more interesting bits. Um, the entire process of drafting these conventions, of agreeing these model laws, is incredibly slow and cumbersome. Um, it takes a long time. It, we're talking about years, possibly decades of some of these. And also, um, there's a sort of an underlying tension in most instances between trying to find a rule at the international level which is best for international commercial transactions and one that reflects the different interests which different jurisdictions might have, which they might be reluctant to cede. Um, and this inevitably results in compromises um, to find a balance between these competing interests. And that does affect the quality of, say, the conventions which might be agreed, and indeed the model laws. Although not so much with the model laws. People tend to be less um, persistent when it comes to model laws. But certainly when it comes to conventions, there is a lot of tension in actually achieving the right sort of text. Not least because treaties, as they're intergovernmental, have to go through quite a complex diplomatic process and then have to go through the process of ratification. In other words, decisions by individual governments to sign up to these conventions and make them part of their law. And even where this happens, we are left with a big problem, inconsistency in terms of the way these international texts are applied and indeed interpreted. And this is a, a perennial issue, despite some quite valiant attempts in the context of the sales convention to try and deal with that matter, but it hasn't had a great deal of success. So let's come on to the next bit, the more interesting bit, I think. This was a general background to what international commercial law is, but of course we're interested in how it affects the digital world. So when we talk about the digital world, what do we mean? Um, let me say a few words about the context in which this digital world has arisen. It's, of course, down to the way technology has developed rapidly over the last two or three decades or so. Um, you know, most of you will have probably got a smartphone or something in your pockets or on your table. Yeah, I can see one there, for example. Yeah. Um, people have got smartphones. Computing capacity is enormous these days. When I was a teenager, you know, sort of spotty 13-year-old, um, I had this amazing computer, a Commodore 64, with 64 kilobits of, of memory. It was incredible. Could do all sorts with that, play games, do word processing, you know. Um, but, you know, 64 kilobits, come on. You know, 
Uh, these days, of course, we're talking about gigabytes and terabytes and so on. We're talking completely different dimensions. And that's rapidly happened in the last few years. Um, it's grown enormously and at, at, at ever-increasing speed. What this has allowed is the development of what is now known as smart computing technology. You all have your smart, or many of you will have smartphones. You will see smart technology in other areas. Um, some people might have fancy gadgets at home by which they control their entire household environment. Um, for example, they can control their digibox from their phone and they can control their heating from their phone and their boil and everything. So you can have a lot of this technology now in a very compact form. Add to this the increasing spread of high-speed high speed broadband. There is quite a bit of that. Although I think a lot of us will think we're not convinced that our broadband really is high speed despite promises made by BT or other suppliers. But uh, that is the story. We have high speed broadband. We have the increasing use of digital content. In other words, software or uh, you know, app applications which control a lot of our devices. Most physical items now rely on software to function properly. Yeah. Not just your phones and your computers and so on, but very basic household items like your dishwasher or your washing machine, uh, your car, of course, VW. Um, they're all controlled by software and digital content. And the way the software is designed allows somebody who controls that software to influence the performance of a physical device. Yeah? All of this taken together is often referred to as disruptive technology after a guy called Christensen who came up with this notion of disruptive technology, technology which really impacts on the way existing business models operate and pushes towards the creation of new business models, and in this case, new digital business models in particular. And that's our digital world. Now, hang on. When we talk about disruptive technology, where do we see the main impact? As you've already seen as, a, uh, as an early flash-up, we see a lot of shifting from the physical environment simply to the digital environment. I think everybody now is familiar with online shopping. I think most of you have used Amazon. You might be reluctant about using Amazon, but you will have used Amazon, and you will have bought books at Amazon. 30 years ago, 25 years ago, you would have gone to the high street to a bookshop. It's a place where they have books on shelves, and you can browse and choose the books you like, and you can have a little read and put them back if you don't like them. Um, yeah, so that's obviously changed. You can do a shopping online. Yeah, you don't have to go down to the Sainsbury's or Waitrose anymore. You can just do it online and avoid a lot of hassle that way. Lots of things have happened which have simply moved physical ways of conducting business to the digital environment. But that's not the exciting stuff. The exciting stuff has happened since. Yeah, starting with the rise of the platform economy. Yeah, the way we now use online platforms as an intermediary, as a forum where large numbers of suppliers scattered all around the world can get in touch with large numbers of customers. Yeah. Amazon, of course, is a classic example, or Alibaba, the Asian version of it, uh, but also our famous sharing economy platforms such as Airbnb or Uber. Most of you will have heard about Uber, which isn't really a platform, but that's a different story, which I'll have to leave for another time. Shapeway is a very famous one um, that some of my students uh, found out about today. Um, that's one big development. The second big development I'm absolutely enthralled by is the spread of 3D printing or additive layer manufacturing to give it its proper way, proper phrase. This is a way whereby physical items are now designed as electronic files, as CAD files, computer-aided design files, um, and can be printed on demand. These goods can be heavily customized to suit an individual's needs, and the technology is already used quite widely in certain sectors. Uh, interestingly, in the medical sector, for example, where it's now possible to print devices to really suit somebody's individual requirements. Yeah? So a hip joint that's designed for your own hip. Um, before it's long, there might be a hard valve designed to suit your own heart, but hey, I had to use the standard one, and that was a, a, an issue. Um, so there are interesting developments there with additive layer manufacturing. The Internet of Things, connected devices, the way devices now talk to one another, um, how sensors are used in everything to provide data, to allow people to adjust the performance of devices, uh, allow devices to talk to one another. Um, all sorts of possibilities have arisen here. Um, a very common example, which isn't actually that practical, is the uh, self-ordering fridge, of course. A fridge which can monitor how much you've got left in your fridge, and it can reorder your milk just before the best before date has been reached on your current supply. 
and it can just restock your fridge whenever you want. So all of a sudden, Asda or Sainsbury's or other supermarkets will ring on your door and saying, your fridge is just out of these goods. Can you put them away, please? Um, that's the story. More significant, it is of some use, for example, in, in, a, in a commercial environment uh, where there's proper stock monitoring using sensor technology, and it allows, for example, supermarkets to be restocked on the basis of just-in-time delivery. Yeah, where there's a continuous monitoring of stock, and as soon as stock runs low, the system triggers a reorder without somebody having to do a manual stock check and ring up the supplier. Um, I won't say too much about robotics and, and artificial intelligence. Both are heavily on the rise. Robots are getting more complex and more capable, more agile, and are starting to learn for themselves how they should do certain jobs. Okay. It's still very basic at the moment. We're not quite yet at the stage where we've got uh, the, the, the humans portrayed on the Channel 4 program uh, replacing uh, you know, real-life humans, but we might move in that direction eventually. The data economy is another big development. Data has become an important feature of economic dealings. Um, whether as a separate commodity, as, as a subject of a contract in its own right, um, as a way of paying for things, which you have all done, perhaps not realizing, because most of you will have downloaded apps from the Play Store or from the iStore onto your phones, paid nothing for it. Well, you have paid. You've paid with your personal data, which is worth a lot to some of these businesses. And we're increasingly seeing how data is being used in combination with algorithms to tailor your online experience. Yeah. Whether it's the kinds of things you see on Facebook or on Twitter, to the kinds of suggestions Amazon makes when you go onto the Amazon website, to the pricing that Amazon sets, or other websites set for the goods you might be looking at. Yeah. Discriminatory pricing is a big issue, I think, increasingly. Finally, of course, we have distributed ledger technology, the blockchain, which of course is most famously used for the rather less successful Bitcoin currency, but also has quite significant practical applications which are slowly being developed. Um, for example, from a commercial point of view, the rise of smart contracts is really something which is attracting a lot of attention. The way you can convert contracts from a basic document into a series of events in the blockchain, um, which can then be performed through the blockchain. So one practical application we've seen, for example, is a very basic travel insurance situation whereby um, an insurance will pay out as soon as your flight has been cancelled. You don't have to make a claim. The insurance will monitor flight data information as soon as the trigger point has been reached saying the flight's been cancelled. You will be credited with the money you need to rebook your flight. It's all happening automatically via the blockchain. Um, so that's an interesting application. What does it mean for law? How does law respond to such technological developments? It's obviously a challenge for law to keep pace with these very exciting technological developments. But of course, having to keep pace with the de developments is nothing new. It, law has always had to adapt to significant leaps in technology. Think about when transport moved from horseback to the motor car. You know, there had to be significant changes to the law to reflect that, for example. So having to think about technological developments is something which has always been built into the law to some extent. Legislation has often been designed with a degree of future-proofing in mind. For example, in my previous life as a consumer lawyer, um, I spent quite a bit of time looking at the regulation of unfair commercial practices, which happens in the UK through the Consumer Protection, of, of unfair, of consumer protection Against Unfair Trading Regulations in 2008. And there we have a, a law which is quite flexibly designed to be adaptable to a whole range of different circumstances, including circumstances which couldn't be envisaged back in 2005 when the European directive behind these regulations was first adopted. Yeah. So there's a degree of future-proofing, and the, the extent to which the directive is future-proof is being tested now as the Commission develops guidance to see how the directive might apply to some of the developments in the digital economy. So far, so good. It looks like it's, it's just about doable. The difficulty is that previous technological developments, whilst also probably disruptive, haven't been developing at the same pace and not to the same extent as the digital revolution. We're in a completely different ballgame now as far as speed and size of the revolution which is happening in the digital world. And that will soon highlight the limitations of future-proofing. It will mean that whilst we can try and accommodate some, possibly quite a few of these developments within existing law, we may have to move onwards and come up with 
new legislation, new ideas. We may need new rules. Um, the number of reasons why we might need such new rules, first of all, of course, existing rules may simply no longer be relevant, may be obsolete. Yeah. Um, I think some of you may know when the motor car was first introduced in the United Kingdom, you had to have a little man walking in front of the car with a red flag to warn people. Um, but soon the cars were a lot faster than the person walking in front and that created more problems than it was worth. So the rule was obsolete and had to be removed. Um, some of the rules that we have might be ne or that we don't have might be necessary to facilitate new developments. Some we need to control or restrict developments. Some things we might not want to happen despite the fact that they can happen. For example, we might not want price discrimination by an online platform and therefore we might want rules to prevent that if existing rules don't allow us to do that already. Well, whenever you have a new development, there's a, a real sort of danger in many ways from a legislative point of view. You've got to look very carefully at the development and decide whether the time for action has already come. Um, sometimes it might be worth your while just to wait and see as to what will happen. Yeah? So there's a sort, of, a sort of cautious approach. But there's a danger there that you might either end up with a legal framework which is entirely unsuitable already, or that you miss the boat in introducing appropriate regulation and a new development will take on a life of its own. Yeah. A big question at the moment is to what extent online platforms ought to have been regulated more closely already. There's a lot of work being done now in controlling the way, for example, Facebook and Twitter deal with some of the harmful content that might be published online, but that might be a bit too late. Um, I knew you said something about horse and stable door, but that sounds like such an old-fashioned metaphor. I don't really want to... Uh, bring that back. So what sort of methodology does law need to try and become more robust in responding to, to these new developments? I think first of all the important thing is to understand what these new business models that I introduced a few moments ago actually do. What is 3D printing all about? What is the platform economy all about? What's going on? Actually get an understanding of what happens. What does Uber really do? Turns out they're not a platform at all, they're a pipeline that simply organises a big transport company as we've now had confirmed by both UK and European courts. Yeah, interesting developments. So understand the business model. Then very carefully think about what your legal questions are regarding these new business models. What are you really interested in? What's really causing concern? With platforms, for example, what are the main legal questions? Is it perhaps the status of suppliers on the platform? Are they all businesses and therefore compliant with consumer law? Yeah. Are they hobbyists, just offering something on the platform without any kind of obligation towards uh, a, a consumer protection law? Are they people who started out as private sellers on eBay, who've made it such a successful venture by selling all their uh, unnecessary belongings that they're now classed as a business and therefore have to comply with consumer protection laws? That's a very basic question. Yeah. Um, online platforms, or the likes of Uber or eBay or Amazon, be directly liable to a customer for the performance of the underlying supply contract? Those are the kinds of questions you might identify, and many, many more. What you then do is, once you've identified what your questions are, you see what the existing law will do. How far can you push the existing law sensibly in order to perhaps find answers to some of these problems, these dilemmas? You might take things quite a long way. You might also, though, identify that there are gaps in existing laws, that there are unnecessary rules in existing laws which create obstacles, and that they're simply unresolved questions for which you will, do, will not find any answer in existing laws. And that's when you have to go along and think what might need to be done next. Can you, for example, deal with some of these gaps just by clarifying the way existing rules should be applied? There's been a grey area, especially in English law, where case law, of course, always leaves plenty of grey areas, as many contract law students will undoubtedly confirm. Um, sometimes you need to make minor reforms just to clarify the way these existing rules should work. Minor amendments might solve the trick, or you might have to go for much wider reform because you've identified an obstacle or a gap or an unresolved issue which really requires a fresh approach, a fresh answer. So what wider reforms could we think about? We could look at what the problem is and see if we can borrow from existing rules and transfer what they have done in, a, in one context into a different context. So for example, the regulation of software or digital content, which is a very prevalent topic now, has for many, many years caused a lot of headaches because people have been trying to categorise a contract involving the supply of software or of digital content. 
Um, and there have been all sorts of contortions to try and say it's either a supply of goods or a supply of services, very often for the simple reason that there are existing laws in place that deal with the supply of goods or the supply of services, and at least we can borrow those rules. But they're not necessarily ideal for a contract involving the supply of digital content. So you might need different rules. But you can possibly draw a parallel, as has happened, for example, in the UK, between goods and digital content, because the concern is quite often about adequate quality and fitness for purpose of digital content, and there are already existing laws in place in the context of goods. So why not borrow from those rules and develop rules on digital content by analogy? This is what happened in the consumer context in the Consumer Rights Act 2015 in the UK. The European Union is about to finalise its own directive on this topic with a slightly different approach. It doesn't completely follow the approach to goods in the way it deals with digital content, but the approach is broadly similar. There are quite significant variations in the detail, but the approach is similar. But that might not be the best way forward. We might need um, completely new solutions for what are effectively entirely new problems. Yeah. For example, we may identify that the, the very paradigm on which existing law is based, for example, a two-party contract, which we saw right at the beginning, really doesn't work anymore with the complex contractual networks we see on platforms. Can we really analyse platforms as a sequence of bilateral contracts? Or do we have something completely different? Yeah. And this may mean that both existing legal rules and the underlying principles or concepts are no longer suitable in the digital environment. So we have to develop new legal regimes. And some examples, um, just to throw them up, for example, liability regimes in the Internet of Things on 3D printing, where you have multiple parties coming together at the same time to produce something. So, for example, with 3D printing, where it's now possible, for example, for a business to print an item which it has acquired via a software file from a supplier, they can print it on their own premises, for which they have to acquire a printer and the raw materials to do the printing. So all of a sudden, instead of buying the finished item, the finished component from its supplier, a business may now buy the software file from one supplier, the printer from another, the materials from a third, and they need somebody to operate the printer consistently. Yeah. So the entire question of liability changes because you suddenly have multiple parties involved. And that's leaving aside the incredible burden of proof that might arise. Um, similarly, online platforms, a lot of work is currently being done uh, within the European Law Institute Working Group, of which I am a member. Um, and we started off by trying to do all this via contractual relationships. And at the most recent meeting, we were looking at the, the sort of relationship between suppliers and the platform. We were getting to the stage where we are thinking contract law has really reached its limits and we might have to take a different approach and perhaps borrow from competition law and develop a whole new market-based model in the way platforms are regulated. We'll wait and see what, what this will eventually produce. So that's something that might happen in the not too distant future. So we've looked at international commercial law. We've looked at the basic ingredients of the digital world. We've looked at the challenges for law when it comes to dealing with um, technological developments in general and some pointers as to what might happen in the digital world. Let's now bring this together with international commercial law. Why should it matter from the international commercial law point of view that we have a digital world? Yeah. A lot of it seems to be about consumers. Well, there is quite a bit of emphasis on consumers, but that doesn't mean that a lot of these developments aren't relevant to commercial parties. Um, and we will soon see a number of instances where the digital revolution is really important for commercial parties. Um, and of course, bearing in mind that the internet and the digital world generally is borderless, you would think that international level action is probably required, at least in some instances. Yeah. Um, we can see the way, for example, digital uh, developments already affect the way international commerce works. Um, with my group this morning, in my master's group, we were talking about the way 3D printing has the potential to really undermine global trade. Some speculations suggest that up to 50% of global trade can be replaced by 3D printing in the next three decades. Which means essentially that instead of trading goods and shipping goods all around the world, all we'd be doing is sending design files around the world through the internet and all these goods are now printed locally, either on site in a factory, if we're talking about components, or through local or regional specialised 3D printing companies. And we'll take away a lot of the uh, transactions we currently have, 
uh, in terms of arranging global trade. And a lot of the trade agreements which are based on physical trade and goods might cease to be relevant because all of a sudden we're trading digital content. Yeah. There's all sorts of new questions which may need to be addressed at the, digital, at the, at the uh, international level. So you might ask, well, surely there has been some recognition of this, and international commercial does already address some of these things. Well, you'd be surprised how little international commercial law does. Let me do a very quick survey, and it will be quick because there isn't very much to talk about when it comes to looking at international commercial law and digital matters. Um, it all started in 1996 when ANSITRAL developed a model law on e-commerce just to help individual countries develop their domestic laws to facilitate e-commerce. Now, 1996, the internet had barely been made available. Yeah. If anybody was born after 1996, yes, we still used to do old-fashioned things like pick up the telephone and talk to people. We used to read books and we used to go to the shops to negotiate things and write on paper. But in 1996, the internet had just been made available. It became globally accessible and therefore the economic potential was realized almost immediately and Ancetral presented a model law. Very much designed just to try and make sure that existing legal rules would work in the digital environment. So the approach that was initially taken was not to say, oh God, it's something completely new and different. We need new rules. It was to say, okay, what do we need to tweak to make sure familiar rules can be used in the digital environment? So in many ways, to use the language of an update or a patch, that's precisely what was done. Existing laws were effectively patched, were updated with a number of rules, which dealt with basic issues such as the validity of electronic or digital communications, um, with ways of expressing requirements familiar from the paper world, the physical world, such as the use of writing or signature or the relevance of an original document with a functional equivalent. And it addressed basic questions such as when a digital message is dispatched and received. I won't talk about the detail uh, here because that would take us another three hours. Interestingly, at the time, 71 states and under over 150 jurisdictions adopted legislation based on this model law. Um, 71 states, 150 jurisdictions. Of course, the United States itself has 50 jurisdictions and they've all gone for the model law. So that's why we've got many more jurisdictions than states. Um, this was followed in 2001 by a model law on e-signatures, which is very much out of date in so many ways, so I won't talk about that any further. But there has been a convention on electronic commun communications adopted in 2005, which effectively takes many of the provisions from the model law and writes them into an international treaty. So the assumption seems to be, okay, these rules work, we'll make them an international standard. Um, a lot of what the convention does is, again, try and take this patching approach, this updating approach, and it does so on the basis of two key uh, principles. The first one is the so-called functional equivalence principle. Try and find things in the digital environment which perform the same function that certain things will perform in the physical world. Okay? So find out what is functionally equivalent to a signature, for example, in the digital context. But do so also, and this is where things get a bit difficult, do so in a way that doesn't tie you to any particular technology. Yeah, because of course technology develops rapidly uh, and what might be current in 2005 will already be out of date by 2008. Yeah? So it tries to be technological neutral. What it does is it essentially replicates what's in the model law but also has additional provisions clarifying, for example, that a website is simply asking people to make an offer to enter into a contract. It deals, interestingly, with the validity of contracts, either with or indeed between what, they, what are called automated messaging systems. In other words, computers talking to one another. This is the kind of scenario we have in the Internet of Things, for example, or perhaps self-driving cars, which are constantly talking to other machines. And a very basic rule on the correction of input errors. Again, nothing particularly earth-shattering. Um, the convention is in force, but only between a small number of countries, which I've all listed on the sheet here, on the slide here. Cameroon, Congo, the Dominican Republic, Fiji, Honduras, Montenegro, well, Russia, Singapore, and Sri Lanka. But not exactly you know, a widespread in the world of global international trade, so uh, not a huge number of ratifications. Interestingly, President Obama, in the dying months of his presidency, did recommend to Senate that they might ratify this particular convention. I'm not sure if he was joking or just trying to tease Senate at that point in time, but he did make the recommendation, which unsurprisingly, Senate didn't take up. 
Um, just to give you a very brief flavor of how this convention deals with this idea of functional equivalence and technological neutrality. Let me just pick a couple of examples. The requirement that a document has to be in writing, how is that reflected as a functional equivalent uh, approach? Well, it says that something is the, the functional equivalent of being in writing if there's information contained in the electronic communication which is as accessible so as to be suitable, so, so usable for subsequent reference. <coughs> well, that tells you everything you need to know, doesn't it? Um, similarly, a requirement that a document has to be signed is achieved if you use a method which is used to identify the party and to indicate that party's intention in respect of the information contained in the electronic communication. Well, that's a nice way of describing the function of a signature, but how do you achieve that in the digital environment? Well, by using a method which is as reliable as appropriate for the purpose for which the electronic communication was generated. Everybody happy now? No, because I am not. Uh, it's, it's very interesting, but also very useless because it doesn't tell you anything about how you actually develop, for example, a method that satisfies the requirements. The convention simply doesn't address the next step. It gives you these basics, but doesn't go any further. But there is hope, because in 2017, uh, Trial agreed its model law on electronically transferable records. Um, electronically transferable records basically relates to documents, which are very common in international commerce, where being in possession of the document itself entitles you to receive performance of the attached obligations. Yeah? So for example, a bill of lading or a bill of exchange might be uh, uh, examples of this. Um, so the idea is that you have the document means you can demand performance. Okay? So it all hinges on the document. The model law tries to reflect this notion that the person in possession as the right to demand performance, by working out what the hallmark of possession is. If you are in possession of something, you are effectively able to control whatever it is that's in your possession. So instead of talking about possession of an electronic record, the model law talks about control over the electronic record. Yeah? So possession of a transferable document instrument, that requirement is met with respect to an electronic transferable record if a reliable method is used. Here we go again, what's that going to be? Um, to establish exclusive control of that electronic transferable record by a person and to identify that person as the person in control. Yeah. But what is more interesting, not just the way this particular idea of functional equivalence is reflected, is the recognition in this model law, something that the convention is lacking, but which is a really important development, that you can basically satisfy the reliable method criterion by complying with any available, applicable international standards. Now, international standards are technical rules quite often developed under the auspices of the International Standards Organization, the ISO, which some of you may have heard about, or perhaps at the European level by CEN, you may have heard about CEN standards. Those are standards which are offering a lot more detail as to how you satisfy certain broad flexible requirements that might be pinned down in legislation. And there's an increasing school of thought developing that says we can do a lot more by combining legal rules and broad standards uh, to give a much more comprehensive regulatory framework instead of trying to do everything through legislation. Uh, other areas where we have action, easily summarized, um, we have the electronic registry under the Cape Town Convention. I'll come back to this in a moment. And we've had some additional discussions. For example, there's been a long-standing debate in the literature on the sales convention whether the definition of goods extends to software. There are all sorts of interesting debates there. Um, we also have some suggestions, for example, that in the area of secure transactions, there ought to be better recognition of electronic means of self-help. So, Giuliano, there's more work for you to be done there in the future. Um, and there's some work ongoing at Ancestral right now on identity management and trust services and cloud computing, but none of the developments which are highlighted earlier, interestingly, none of that is currently on the agenda at Ancestral. So what can we say about ICL and its role in the digital world? So far, it's done very little beyond addressing the shift from physical to the digital environment. But it should be able to do more because one of the big strengths of international commercial or more generally is to identify those really significant obstacles to international commerce and develop appropriate solutions. And that's where ICL should come into its own. Um, if you bear in mind the special nature of the digital world, the fact that it is 
you know, global, borderless, you can't really compartmentalise what goes on in the digital world by simply drawing national boundaries. Um, you do need to have a high level of coordination between different jurisdictions to ensure a consistent approach that will support digital international commerce rather than impede it by having silly national rules suddenly making things impossible. So where do we go from here? What's the future? Well, the immediate future, I think, is to do the unthinkable and to try and update existing ICL measures, to try and update existing conventions, which, of course, runs into its own difficulties because in order to update a convention, you need a new international treaty to amend the convention. And that can take decades in this current form. But there are important challenges beyond updating. For example, there has to be clarity at the international level how you deal with digital content. You cannot go on by having these rather complex and rather difficult contortions as to whether digital content might be a contract of goods or services or contract of hire or something else. It needs to be addressed head on in a way that um, makes digital content clearly tradable as something in its own right. Um, not least because of the likely changes that 3D printing will introduce in the international commercial environment. There needs to be clarity. But also things like smart goods, goods which are controlled by software. Um, digital content is extremely important in that regard. We need to have clarity on how we deal with data as a commodity, data as an object of commerce, not just as something that's subject to quite detailed data protection rules uh, to protect fundamental values. We have to find the right balance here to ensure that trade and data can operate. Um, online platforms can offer a lot of potential, not just for consumer sales, but also, of course, for global services, the global service industry, where platforms can be set up to connect suppliers of services all around the world with customers all around the world. And again, that might require perhaps regulation of service provision as well as the regulation of online platforms at the international level. And of course, the blockchain and the applications that we might have in the blockchain. One of the big advantages of the blockchain is that it can replace uh, business models and indeed legal environments which rely on a trusted third party intermediary. So going back to the beginning, our documentary credit system involving banks could be replaced entirely by an efficient blockchain application. Yeah. But that will re raise new questions about how the blockchain is regulated and how blockchain developments interact with relevant national laws. So there are clear challenges for international commercial law. Um, the main challenges start with its very basic features and hallmarks. Yeah? The fact that ICL has suffered from very much this top-down approach based on reaching compromises between individual, individual jurisdictions, trying to really focus on domestic state law interests and trying to balance those. This has all been very well so far in a different kind of geopolitical context. It's no longer feasible in the digital world. We need to have the involvement of multiple stakeholders in the drafting of uh, an appropriate legal framework. We can't do it simply by having negotiations between governments. We need much swifter, more agile procedures. The lengthy diplomatic process that we currently have simply doesn't work anymore. And we have to be much more flexible. And perhaps at a most basic level, we need to learn to combine legal rules with international standards much more broadly. That has to become a new pattern. Subject, of course, to the proviso that we need to ensure a reasonable degree of transparency and accountability in the way these standards are created. We can't simply defer to obscure international agencies drafting things without any kind of accountability. So there are problems there as well. ICL does have a model for this already, so it wouldn't be an entirely new approach, but one that needs to be modified. And that is the Cape Town Convention, one of the most successful international treaties. It was adopted in 2001 to develop an answer to a problem for international financing particularly for aircraft, which is where the convention has its main application so far. It allows um, a lender or somebody who supplies an aircraft on a leasing term, for example, to register its interest over the aircraft in an international registry. Um, and therefore, the international interest is enforceable in all the countries which have signed up to this treaty, of which there are quite a few. And we're talking about, I think, 70 or thereabouts at the moment. The interesting thing is the way the Cape Town Convention works. It has a so-called baseline convention, which deals with all the fundamental issues that should be relevant to all the different types of goods, well, three categories essentially at the moment, to which the convention is ultimately intended to apply. In this case, aircraft, 
railway rolling stock, and space equipment. However, the detailed rules dealing with the specific requirements of the airline industry and the railway industry and the space industry are set down in separate protocols. So the detail is worked out in a separate document which is tailored for one particular industry. Okay. The problem is, as they are protocols, they also need to be ratified by states. So that's still falling back on the difficult sort of reliance on individual states signing up to these things. Um, but the other interesting thing is that the drafting of these protocols involve not only governments and lawyers, but it, they involve interest groups representing the industries themselves, the airline industry, airline manufacturers, banks involved in financing aircraft, for example. They were all involved in the discussions leading up to the drafting of the protocols. And that significantly improved the quality um, and has really been behind uh, the rapid success of the convention, signed in 2001, enforced in 2005, and extremely wide numbers of ratifications, and clear evidence of a significant economic impact. I don't think the likes of EasyJet and Ryanair would have had as many aircraft as they have now if it hadn't been for this convention. I mean, that must have been a very significant contributor in reducing the cost of acquiring aircraft. So this model could be used for the digital world in the same way. Yeah, we could have a convention establishing, say, key, key principles and, and essential legal rules, for example, what we do about digital content, but then leave some of the more detailed questions to international standards, provided, of course, these international standards are developed in a transparent and accountable fashion. Now, I promise I wouldn't talk for more than 50 minutes. I'm getting to that threshold, so let me just throw the last few conclusions to wrap things up. What have we seen this evening in a fairly broad brush way? Well, I hope you will have seen this anyway. Um, Clearly, the digital world will have a huge impact on the way international business operates now. There are so many new business models developing, and they really affect the way existing digital com international commerce is structured, and the rise of digital business models will eventually be really significantly felt. This prompts new legal issues that will need to be addressed, obviously not just internationally, but also regionally and indeed domestically, but there will be certain issues that need to be addressed at the international level. At the moment, yeah, despite the fact that we need a global response to some of these, international commercial law is not in its current shape ready for these new developments, um, both in terms of its methodology, but also in terms of the rules which we currently have. We're still at a very basic level. So there has to be a lot of work done at a fairly rapid pace to ensure that international commerce is not left without an appropriate international level framework to support it. Of course, you might want to say, well, shall we just wait and see what happens about international commerce, to what extent there really will be this big impact? Is 3D printing really going to be that revolutionary? Is the blockchain really going to replace, say, documentary credits? Or is this just, you know, a nice blue skies thinking? Lose the theme tonight, of course. Or is it something else? Yeah. However, if we are too slow and don't recognize that there's a challenge, we might end up with having too many legal obstacles which will be a real impediment to international commercial activity. And of course, if that doesn't support the digital economy properly, it makes life just so much more difficult and so much more expensive. And of course, that's not what we want. And at this point, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you.